Amen. Let's pray. Holy Father, how we love you. You're so glorious. You're so incredible. Father, I thank you. Lord, for the opportunity. Thank you that you've called us, Lord, to be, to be yourself in the earth, to be who you are, to be your expression, to be your very glory demonstrated. Thank you for the honor. Thank you for the glory. Thank you, Father. Touch our hearts today, Lord. Lord, whatever small thing, whatever large thing, whatever you would say this day, Father. Lord, may it be given back to you, Lord, as an offering to say how much we love you. Thank you, Jesus, for the power and the anointing of your spirit. Thank you for opening our ears and opening our eyes to see you more clearly, to hear you more clearly. Lord, that we be those that are transfigured and changed. We thank you, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God is good. I want to welcome a lot of new people here today. I'm sure you're here for Moses. Bless you all for coming. We do things a little differently around here. It's not easy, I have to tell you. Because we're leaning into God. And uh, there was nothing wrong with the old way. It's just that God said, I'm doing something new. And so he's calling us always continually forward. We were standing in a different glory. And now he's revealing another glory. And he's asking us to step forward into a pathway that we really don't know. And so we have to lean and listen into him. It's hard on the flesh. It's easier when you've got it all figured out and somebody's telling you what to do. Stand up, sit down, raise your hands, praise the Lord. Time to give the offering now. Now you can be seated. Now you can exit. It's a lot easier. But he's leading us in a way that we've not known. And it is a way of glory. And if I could say anything today, it's about the glory of God. That's what he's put on my heart. Praise the Lord. You know, the Lord is leading us individually in a process of, that we call salvation. It's beyond that initial point in which we said, Jesus, come into my life. It's an ongoing, progressive journey. And so this is the moving from glory to glory to glory. And every step of the way, he asks us if we witness with what he is saying. Do we say, yes, I agree. If we don't agree, we don't agree. We don't go forward. We can never move into his salvation unless we say, yes, I receive what Jesus did. I witness with what he did. We cannot move forward into the moving of the Holy Spirit unless we say, yes, I agree. The Holy Spirit has come to fill my life. I witness with that. And we confess it with our mouth. Paul wrote that with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. Meaning if I believe, I'm righteous. But with the mouth... Confession is made unto salvation. We usually quote that when it's time for people to get saved. Come to the altar. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. But I don't see where it has any point of ending. Because wherever he's leading us, he's asking us to confess. And that is the witness. I can testify that I know he has said, move forward with me. And so confession is made with the mouth unto a greater salvation and a greater salvation 
and a greater salvation. I was struck this week as I was reading the book of Hebrews. And there is given a clear warning. Let me turn to it. A clear warning to believers. If I can find it. There it is. Chapter 2. He says, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things that we have learned, to things that we've heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, what a comparison. We've heard words spoken by God. But if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. I think of Zechariah and the word that was brought to him about his son, how he would be the forerunner of Christ. And Zechariah questioned because he and his wife were aged. He was listening to an angel. And he received a just recompense for his unbelief. The guy was dumb for 12 or 9 months, however long his wife was pregnant. I think it was only 9. <laughs> it was longer back then. It was longer back then. Thanks for the save, Mike. <laughs> so if this word from an angel brought about a just recompense, how shall we escape if we neglect, I just was struck with that, neglect so great a salvation? Not that one where you just ask Jesus to come into your heart and every morning read from some devotional and sit on a pew dutifully and hope and pray that you can get to heaven and walk a street of gold. Not, not that salvation. That's not the one I'm talking about. I'm talking about the so great salvation. How shall we escape if we neglect? Because what God has spoken to us is phenomenal. What he has actually called us into is more than we know. May God open to our hearts what he has called us into. Paul speaks about this glory of God. In fact, he declares in Romans 2 that we are to seek glory, honor, and immortality. Seek glory. We've been told not to seek glory. But it's not talking about fame. He's not talking about adulation. He's talking about the very glory of God. You see, the very glory of God when Christ went to heaven, was transferred to the body of Christ. The body of Christ are the glory carriers now. Of Jesus, John wrote that we beheld his glory. They looked upon Jesus and they saw the very glory of God. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. I wish that word only had not been put there. He was the only begotten for a time. Are you born of God? Are you begotten of God? We also are to be those that others will look upon and say, we beheld the glory of God upon those people. The glory of God. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians, You have been called by my gospel. He had the gospel. The gospel of salvation. The, the get saved gospel. The, the get baptized in the Holy Spirit gospel. He said, You've been called by my gospel to the obtaining of the glory of God. So compressed within the gospel message is this message that we are to actually obtain the glory of God. Run after it. Obtain it. 
Are we just running and beating the wind? What's the goal before us in the here and now? Because for so long, we have sang songs about going to glory, the by and by, when I get to glory. It's a now. It's a present tense thing that we must obtain. We really truly are going from one degree of glory to another. It's the glory of God. We are being transfigured into that same glory. I'm a witness of something about God's glory. You see, what we see and what we experience, we become a witness of that. And this witness that I want to share with you, some of you have heard me say it, is that I have seen the visible glory upon people's lives. Not just what they do. I'm not talking about something ethereal. I'm talking about something visible. And it happens at the most unusual times. Two of us are sitting in our nightgowns at a retreat, you know, just sipping coffee, talking about Jesus. And suddenly, the glory of God would fall upon that person. And I was looking. And I want to say twice in my life has it been reciprocated where the person that I was sharing, talking about Jesus, I saw glory on them and they saw glory on me. I wondered why I wasn't reading about this or hearing other people talk about it for a long time. In fact, I was embarrassed to talk about it because I thought, well, maybe I just am imagining something. But in my heart, I knew I wasn't. I knew I was seeing something that was very real because when I would begin to see the glory of God, I was being pulled in like I was being sucked into a vortex of holiness, of God's glory. And every part of my being became enveloped in God's love. It had a great effect on me. I now know that that was a foretaste. It started 25 years ago. As a little, well, maybe it was more than that. I'm 60. I was 27 years old when I first saw the visible glory of God. And I saw it on myself first. I walked into a bathroom. And I got ready to do what I do, you know, as you girls do. Guys, guys do it too, right? You're primping. And I stepped back because this light overshadowed me. I'm going to describe exactly what it was. I'm looking in the mirror and I'm seeing my face with a large light all around my head, but I could not actually see my face. I couldn't see my face. I just saw this glory all around and I knew I was seeing Jesus' glory. You see, there is an incredible salvation that we have not yet seen. I want to read to you what Peter wrote 2,000 years ago. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us. There you go. Begotten us again to a lively hope, a living hope. There's something that's happened in me when I got begotten of God. He put a living hope on the inside of me to an inheritance incorruptible. Now he's not talking about heaven there. He's talking about you and I. There's an incorruptible inheritance and it's Jesus in us. And his life is eventually going to work through this bodily flesh that is in death. And as Paul said, mortal shall put on immortal. And he said that we've been given this lively hope by this, and it's an incorruptible inheritance, undefiled, that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. He did not say that heaven is reserved for you. 
He said that this incorruptible inheritance is waiting in heaven for you, ready to be revealed in the very last time. Not revealed when you're in heaven. The incorruptible inheritance, the lively hope that is in you, is held in storage for you and I in heaven, ready to be revealed in the last time. This is the so great salvation that we have been looking for. What is it? It's the manifestation of who he is. It's the glorious manifestation of Christ himself. Paul wrote extensively how that Moses, when he was on the mountain, stood before manifest glory of God. And when he came down from that mountain, the glory of God radiated off of him so greatly that he said that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look upon him. It was so permeating, so burning, so convicting, so powerful that they pleaded with him, cover it cover it they couldn't stand it and that glory Paul said was so incredibly glorious and yet there is a greater glory and so because of the greater glory that glory had to fade out and the greater glory is the glory that you and I have stepped into think of it the glory that Moses was under was visible I think he was like a giant beacon Imagine a lighthouse, a giant beacon. He had stood in God's glory. And now you and I are not just standing before God's glory. We have the glory of God in the face of Jesus living and walking on the inside of us. Hallelujah. That glory of God is still veiled within our flesh. Praise the Lord. But there's coming a time, and I believe it is soon, when the Lord will unveil, unveil us before the world. Romans 8 speaks of this. When it says that all of creation is groaning. All of creation, every cricket in Ghana, I would say every goat, every cow, every chicken running around. Every single being, every living thing, every tree, every molecule right down to the level that you and I can't even see is an agonizing expectation waiting, hallelujah, not for the coming of Jesus, but for the manifestation, the uncovering of God's sons. And so we have this treasure, Christ, hidden in an earthen vessel. The glory of God is meant to be seen on us. I'm going to just finish with this one verse. Verses. And then we'll close. This is the chapter where Paul is speaking about Moses. And the veil that was over his face. And how that the veil is still today over Israel. And how God has blinded their eyes. But in Christ, the veil is done away. Let me, let me just make this plain for you. Moses displayed the glory of God. It was on him. It was seen on him. And Paul said that that glory passed away, that the greater glory would come. And the veil is torn when we come to Christ. So everyone in this room who has come to Christ, there's no veil on you. That means the glory is on you. I believe that we are in need of a restoration. We are in need of faith. We are actually in need of faith. We need to step out of our unbelief. We need to move beyond our traditions. And begin to believe that you are the glory of God in the earth. He, kept, he called Israel his glory. And if you are not Israel, then I don't know who is. Paul said, and we, all of us, with unveiled faces. Unveiled, that means the glory of God 
is there. All of us with unveiled faces are like a mirror reflecting the glory of Jesus. So when I look at you, I'm seeing Jesus. You are reflecting back to me, Jesus. Whether you're opening your mouth or not, whether you're performing miracles or not, you are reflecting Jesus. I can see him. And as we together, this is what I want you to see. He says, and we all of us with unveiled faces are like a mirror reflecting the glory of God. And in this action of seeing Christ as we are together are being transfigured. Somehow we had this idea that if I'm at home and I'm just to let me get before the Lord and, and try to behold him. It's not what he's saying. He's saying that we all together are reflecting, are showing and revealing his glory. You see, there's something about this together with that we have been on a journey here at Psalm 19. That together with his voice is more clear. That when there is one that speaks and another brings out another and another one brings out another word and it brings together a composite of the fuller word of God that I myself cannot express the fullness of who Jesus is but that we need each other to reveal and manifest who he is. So we are all unveiled. There is no more, this is the Cindy version, there is no more hiding the glory of God. When I look at you, I see his glory. And you're like a mirror imaging back to me the same glory that is in me. You are imaging back to me the same glory. We beheld his glory. The glory as of the many begotten of God. For the Lord will arise upon you, Isaiah said, and his glory shall be seen upon you. And kings will come to the brightness of your rising. Hallelujah. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? What a great salvation we've been given. We are at the end of an era. We are at the end of an era. And God is leading us forth into ways we've never known. And it will take a willing vessel, a laid down life. As one woman says, Heidi Baker, he's looking for laid down lovers. Laid down lovers. Amen. Who believe that the purpose of the redemption was that there would be a multitude of individuals who reveal the glory of God, who witness and demonstrate who Jesus really is. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you for your word. I ask, Father, for a greater sense of your light within our hearts that we might truly reach for what you have called us to. Touch every heart here, Lord. Draw each one to yourself in a new and a fresh way. Fresh manna, fresh bread, fresh wine. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for dousing each one here, Lord, in the beauty and the beauty of who you are. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for sharing this time of unfolding the word. We welcome your questions and comments about this program, either by mail at Psalm 19 Ministries, 6138 South Salina Street, Syracuse, New York, 13205, or by email at Psalm19Ministries at gmail.com. More information can be found by visiting Facebook or our website at psalm19.org. 
Again, thank you for watching Unfolding the Word.